Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to the nextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock, and Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early, ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the next reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Rollerball is over. Sweet dreams, Moon Pie. Jonathan E., that's the name. Houston players come and go, but the champion plays on. Ah! 
You know how the game serves us. It has a definite social purpose. Nations are bankrupt, gone, no poverty, no sickness. Man has accomplished what he'd always craved. Corporate society was an inevitable destiny, a good life, a centuries-old dream. Okay. Andy, hi, it's Rollerball, 1975, James Kahn. Had you seen this one? I have. I've seen it. I own it. Um, the movie poster is perhaps one of my favorite movie posters. Uh, I've just always loved that image. The font is like... <laughs> yeah. Such a fantastic font. Like, there's a lot to love about this. I, I certainly still have some issues with the film and the pacing, but I, I find it to be a really fascinating uh, story. Excellent. Well, you are are well prepared then. I had seen this movie. It was one of my dad's favorite movies. And uh, so I watched it probably a couple of times with him in the late 80s, I'm going to say. Haven't seen it since then. And so this was a, a really interesting watch to come back to it after so long, especially now. Uh, and, and I think the... Uh, is it fair to say this is one of the first dystopian sport movies? designed for like you know <laughs> designed to make a point uh by the authorities I, I think there's an interesting element to that um i'd have to kind of look at a list but it does seem that this uh was fairly early in kind of the whole concept of um, crafting a dystopian world and then using kind of a blood sport like this as a way to kind of thematically look at how that particular society was um, formed and was society uh, was surviving you know yeah i think that's the thing that is that is most interesting to me is the is the way the movie uh is is able to to push the point that you have so much good in the world there are no wars uh we've fixed disease we've done all kinds of wonderful things for you. And as such, you have there are expectations. Um, you know, we make all the decisions and we expect you to do the things that you're asked. And that is uh, that is the price of all of the good that we have wrought in the world, particularly the, cor you know, that the corporations are in control that please stand for the playing of your corporate anthem, I think has a, a, a really <laughs> interesting sort of like incisive point today, um, you know, as we're uh, just in in the world we're living in today, um, so I I think it's got some really interesting uh, points. What do you think of it now, watching it like as somebody who's been watching it all these years? How well is it? Does it hold up for you? I mean, you say that, and I you know talked about how much I really enjoy this film. It's only a film that came into my life probably in the last twenty years or so. Like I, I feel like I had heard the name and I had kind of had some associations with it, but I had a friend who introduce me to it and that's where kind of like my eyes were opened and and so it's not something that i've had since i was a, a kid or anything like that but it's something that i definitely find um, fascinating and i think what i enjoy so much about it and i think what uh norman jewison directing it paired with uh, william harrison who wrote the original short story upon which it's based the whole idea of it uh, of doing a story like this i think it taps so perfectly into the nature of what so many great science fiction stories have done through, you know, its history of taking societal ideas and kind of looking at it and exploring them in interesting thematic ways of like what a potential future society could look like where, yes, they've fixed all of these wonderful things and they had the corporate wars and, you know, this, this society that is, uh, you know, where, Earth has moved past a point of countries and has has landed even past like the regular corporations. It's landed on just the straight up like corporate uh, the corporations of need. Right. So there's the energy corporation. There's the food corporation. There's the luxury corporation. There's this variety of different corporations that are really just a a type of thing that people need. And that's really how society is run now by these entities and from what we can tell the energy corporation is run by it seems to be six board members and and so really if you take that down and i don't know how many corporations there are maybe 10 let's just say 10 so that's like 60 people 
entirely who are essentially ruling the earth. And as long as they keep people placated, people are happy. And you can see what's so interesting is like they're providing things like the uh, rollerball games to help people. Uh, They're also providing some sort of pill that is a drug that helps people um, calm and be placated. But you can see like when they're at the party, one of their thrills, they're running out and with, with, I don't know, some sort of like a bomb gun. I don't exactly know what it is, but they're blowing up trees. Yeah. Yeah, It's like, this is where society is. And, and in their faces, you can kind of read some sense of like unhappiness, but the corporate control over all of these people is absolute. And that's, what's so fascinating about the break that we have here with Jonathan E as he slowly starts questioning because he just loves playing the game. He doesn't see that the corporation views his rise in popularity and the way that the chanting goes from rollerball to Jonathan, all of a sudden is this shift that they just can't have. And that's, I think that, you know, it's all about the corporate interest. It's not about individual. And that's, I think the, the frightening shift that, uh, I don't know, it makes this film all the more relevant as we kind of, as society has continued from the time this came out in 75. Right. It's it's corporate communism, right? Like you ha- you can have we'll take care of you. You don't own anything anymore. Right. Like but the, the exchange is there can be no celebrity. There is no one person who's going to rise above the rest because that's a recipe for insurrection. And John Houseman, he does not care for it. And so he works hard. He you might say he earns it in his uh, big uh, his efforts to try to um, to bribe Khan Jonathan E uh, to to retire and get out of the game. Um, and and that ends up being our, our sort of central conflict. There was just a little note that I had, I had written down about, you know, the, one of the interesting things, things about ownership in the movie. It, it, we go into him trying to find, you know, the resource, the the it was paper material books things like that. And they've all been digitized and they're all on these servers in what Geneva. And uh, oh, oh, sorry, they got deleted or misplaced. Oh, well. And the, the whole I, sorry, I 13th like, century. Yeah. Sorry, 13th century. And I feel like we're having those conversations <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Like how prescient so many of these like uh, these conceits were with Jewish and like, like I just I was I was kind of amazed I I'm with you I have issues with pacing uh with the movie it it is a bit of a roller coaster in in terms of the the highs and lows fast and slows um and the game took me a while to get excited about um because I think it is dumb but it's also <laughs> very brutal and that's exciting and that makes me a terrible person, which is the conflict of watching Rollerball. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what's interesting about the game is it's not overly complex. And and you're saying that right. it's dumb. But I think the thing about it that I, I find interesting is that it's fairly simple. You have two teams and they've got, uh, I don't know what you're going to call them, but the rollers and the riders, let's just say. And they are trying to, they have a metal ball that is launched out roulette style uh, into the ring, this round uh, uh, arena that they're playing in, and they have to catch the ball, and then they have to roll around the ring, and they have to try to get the ball into their goal, which is on on you know opposing sides, and the other team tries to stop them. So to that end, it's fairly simple, like many sports. You know, you just basically get the ball and get it into the goal, and that's exactly how lots of sports are in this particular case though it involves uh you know spikes on your on your gloves and you've got the motorbikes that uh, you can use to gain speed or to uh, knock people over there's all sorts of things and and so i i i think that's why i find that it ended up being effective as a sport and likely why the actual the the actors and the stuntmen who are in the film enjoyed playing it in their off time because it's just a very fun and easy sport to kind of understand and grasp taking out all of the the killing and maiming and everything but i think that's why for the purposes of the film it was a very easy 
sport to kind of design as a way to use as kind of like an upgrade of gladiatorial combat for to keep the crowds entertained. Well, and I I do think it's interesting the way they munge different sports together, right? They put them in essentially football uniforms. Like we're not we're not it, it, it doesn't look like a football uniform for nothing. And the the allusions to hockey, like these are, are games with um, that are are noted uh, as more brutal physical games and, and roller derby, roller, roller derby is a violent game. Uh, and so being able to munge all these things together for purpose, I think, is interesting to me. Very interesting to me. I think it's it, it's fascinating being able to do it with such interesting opportunities for framing the the audience the corporate overlords the athletes in the game the the uh, authorities and, and and regulators in the middle of the ring is interesting like it just made for an incredible playground for the camera to be able to to be in this like incredibly fast-paced arena of death like it's great and and that final like when when khan at the end is sort of last man standing he's he's like leaning against the glass and houseman's behind him with the flames of the motorcycle reflected in the shot with that like total devil look on his face it's just incredible like they were he's able to to do a lot of stuff to make the thing visually incredibly compelling you know in in the nature of sport yeah and i think what the film ends up doing well to kind of explore is this whole idea of this person who just starts questioning the game. He wants to just play because he enjoys it. He doesn't understand why the corporation has said that he needs to step down. He doesn't get that. He just wants to play. And so it kind of sends him on this journey of exploration. And that's, I think, what builds to such an interesting ending and kind of that psychological battle between Jonathan E. and uh, Mr. Bartholomew. Mr. Bartholomew and the corporations know they just can't take him out. They can't just have him accidentally get in an accident. They need to kind of play it straight. As frustrated as they are with him sticking around, they really want him to get out of there. And so they keep kind of changing the rules of these games to the point where, okay, there's no timeouts, there's no fouls, there's no penalties, eventually to the point where there's no time limit. And the players recognize that what they have essentially turned it into is a blood sport that won't end until there is one man standing. And that's, I think, what was so interesting in how that whole thing kind of shifted and the players kind of start realizing that and to the point where some of the coaches like don't even recognize it, you know, which I thought was interesting when we're in that last game and the coach of New York is arguing with the coach of Houston and the coach of Houston is like, this was never meant to be, you know, a, a simple game. And, and the coach of New York is like, it's never clicked for him. And that's why I found that so interesting that it just never he just never got that. And it takes this moment of this individual standing up to them, but at the very end, also giving them what they wanted of, you know, making sure that he, it wasn't just out and out murder. Like he doesn't crush that guy's face with the ball. He instead stands up and goes to scores the point. Uh, and that's, you know, a wonderful ending that shows kind of the, the victory of the individual over the corporation in this particular case. But it does ask, OK, what's next for the sport? Like, where does it go from here? And that's, I think, um, you know, is an interesting element that, uh, you know, never was actually explored in in future stories, but it sure would have been. Because they just lost two teams completely, right? Like- <laughs> Yeah. They just in one game, they lost new teams except for two guys. I think that is an, another really transparent allegory for control, right? You bring up how they ended up changing the rules, right? These are the buttons and levers of of control that the corporate sort of overlords are are pulling and pushing to make the game more violent. And I think it's it, it, to me that that hit me the 
parallel to sort of either modern sport or modern politics or modern economics, like how simple it can be to change a number or change uh, or push one button and suddenly, you know, uh, entire swaths of of the economy are, are impacted. Like we're we're in a very similar sort of uh, roller coaster right now. And it's confusing. And this game is uh, uh, this movie is is evaluating, like, look where we could end up. You know, look at how easy it is for those in power to take power, you know, excessively. And um, I, I think that's that's always fun to explore in in dystopia. Yeah, no, absolutely. In the scope of uh, kind of like as we're watching our players, you know, James Kahn as our lead, Jonathan E., it's an interesting performance for from him. He really loves the sport. He says it. During games, it, like every time he's playing, he just says, God, I love this sport. <laughs> you know, he really loves rolling around and taking on the other team. But his performance outside of the ring is incredibly quiet. It is a very quiet performance from uh, from James Caan that we don't see when we're looking at things like The Godfather, like when he's the hot-headed guy who, who uh, bursts out and everything. Like this is just an incredibly quiet performance very pensive performance and uh, as we kind of watch him kind of go through this journey of trying to figure things out uh, it's it, i don't know i found it to be really interesting i guess uh, you know khan himself said it was a hard character to to play because he was um uh, it was so quiet and he said he kind of had a, I, I don't know if it was a hard time with it or just he wasn't it didn't really give him a lot of of room to kind of maneuver because he needed to kind of play it so quiet how does it end up working for you? I think having having not watched the movie for a while and having seen a number of other James Conn performances in the intervening years, uh, it it's hard. It was hard for me to buy James Conn as this like this principal athlete, right? I, he doesn't strike me as as that guy. It seemed like a weird casting choice. I t- I think by the end I get it, but um, his his portrayal that sort of the the sort of strong silent type doesn't doesn't fit James Conn to me and and so i think i i think i share that perspective that he is he, as far as i know he was praised for his performance in this movie when it first came out as sort of complicated as the release of the movie might have been but it it I don't know. Did did he outgrow it? Is that what makes it hard harder for me to see? He just doesn't feel like the the central leading athlete on or off the the rink. I buy him as an athlete. Like he definitely seems like. I mean, didn't he actually have a history in football before he got into acting? I I think I feel you're right. like that may have been the case, but um, I have to go look. Yeah, he no, he wanted to play football while he was at Michigan State, um, couldn't make the team, and uh, yeah, so you know, it, it it never quite happened for him. But that's certainly something that he was interested in. I buy him as a sports player, uh, but to your point, I do also kind of struggle with buying him as this really quiet person who's pensively exploring all of this i think that's one of my um challenges with the pacing when it goes into the non-arena scenes you know his kind of pensive ways does actually make me like when we have there is a party when some of the party goers are are talking about the rollerballers and how they're actually just robots and stuff like that it actually made me go well maybe they are really robots you know (laughs) which I mean, I think the film generally gets to a point where they're not actually robots. It's just people might think they are. But I started questioning that because of the way Khan was performing. And I I feel like that is one of the things that I struggle with a little bit. And I think um, had a better remake been made, I think that they could have used his exploration a little stronger in in the way that he was kind of moving through things. But to that end, it does feel like a decision about how they chose to, how he chose to perform, how Jewison chose to direct him, perhaps how Harrison chose to write it in the script, where it just feels very much like that was a choice they made. It's just, for me, it ended up being a choice that is one of the things I struggle with a little bit with the film. Moon Pie. So one of the things that's interesting about this movie in in terms of these, the, the athlete relationships, 
I, I think this is one of the things that they do really, really well in the movie, because I never know as the movie progresses whether or not Moon Pie is going to be a character that's going to be used, uh, that's going to be a genuine friend and colleague of, uh, of Jonathan E., or if he is going to be somehow wielded against Jonathan E. Uh, toward the end of the movie. I ended up really liking the relationship that they had and the way they ended up using Moon Pie. What'd you think of Moon Pie? That sort of sports relationship, I think they create a, a a believable relationship between these characters here. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the way that John Beck plays the character. I thought it was just seemed like the sorts of person who isn't at the level of Jonathan, but wants to be. And, you know, I, I don't know. I just I found him to be a perfect fit for this world of, you know, these people who are designed to be nothing but a pawn in these games and he's just loving it and he's totally fine with that you're totally <laughs> that's, fine why with, yeah it works and that's totally right like he's totally fine with it and he's just a good person right like i i felt like there was enough other malfeasance going on in the authoritarian control of the sport that we didn't need to have an insider on the and i was worried i was i was cinematically anxious that they were going to turn john <laughs> beck into a bad guy and i was going to be pissed and i think they ended up doing that really really well i think it, it, it's nice to see that sort of comradeship on the team not be sullied yeah i think that's uh, a good point and i think it fits in kind of like he needed that buddy, that kind of person who would tag along with him, but also was kind of the voice of the the average player. Like, why do you care about books? You know, why do we need to do this? Why, why, why are you wanting to go see visit the super, supercomputer? Like, I, I think we needed that voice from the, the regular player to kind of understand why Jonathan stood out as different. OK, then, uh, you know, my man, John Houseman. You know, I I just watched Scrooge last night and was reminded that John Houseman also is in that as the yeah. the old man sitting by the fire reading uh, a Christmas carol for the live broadcast of of Scrooge, which was fun to see him in that. But John Houseman is just he is such a face and is one of those people I just I love seeing. He's got just such a great voice. You know, his voice is just amazing. And you know, I, as as somebody who has a pretty important role in Hollywood history, having kind of come up with uh, Orson Welles through um, through Mercury Theater and everything, like he's somebody who's been around for a very long time. I just, I don't know, he's one of those faces that I, I think that he is great. He represents like there is this kind of the British elite, the aristocracy, like he definitely always carries that feel. But in a film like this, where he's the the head of the energy corporation, but at the same time, apparently that also means that he is essentially like the owner of the Houston team. Like I buy him as that owner of the sports team. Like when he comes in to talk to the team, it feels like the you know a modern day corporate owner of some football team coming in to talk to the team and tell them what a great job they did out there. Like I just told it fits perfectly, and he does a great job at that. He is such an interesting guy. Like I I first found I discovered John Houseman. I don't know if you knew that I discovered him, and I discovered him in Silver Spoons. Oh, uh, because uh, God, I loved that show. Right? I forgot who oh, was in that show. God. Grandpa Stratton. Oh my God! Yeah. Wow. But my parents uh, happened to be watching him at the same time on The Paper Chase uh, as uh, Professor Charles Kingsfield. And I think that was a fascinating thing for a guy like John Houseman to do. And he was one of the like, as I got older, I, I start looking at, at John Houseman thinking he's just such an interesting guy to uh, have made the turn from The Paper Chase, the film to end up doing, you know, multiple years, many years on television, uh, playing that same role. I think he was the first, the first guy I ever connected that he had done that, made the leap from the film to a television small screen adaptation in, and, and doing it in the 70s, 80s. That's just the first one that I, I'm sure that I know that others had done it. This was just the first time I ever made the connection with John Houseman. And then, of course, whenever anyone asks how we make money, we make money the old fashioned way. We earn it. That is uh, <laughs> his 
that's will forever be my answer to that question. Because that was because a John House. That was a TV commercial that he did, right? It was a commercial. Yeah. yeah right. Okay. I it's like I feel like I remember hearing his voice say that, but I couldn't. Yeah. Like it's one of those things. Like there are some voices. Like I know Tommy Lee Jones had a great. Like I think it was a car commercial. Like certain voices when they do certain commercials. Like I can kind of pair it with that, but I couldn't tell you like what the product was that Houseman was. That is the I'm I'm oh, Smith Barney. It was Smith Barney. Okay, but talk gotcha. about a weird like like what an effective ad that helps us not remember the product at all. Yeah, I know <laughs> that's the that's the sometimes the problem. Like you remember <laughs> the wrong things about it. Yeah, but oh well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like John Houseman, I thought it was really it was really fun to see him in this movie, and this didn't feel like a John Houseman movie to me either. But it was, you know, pretty early uh, in his film career. Interestingly, about John Houseman, I mean, you look at his credits; uh, he was in Too Much Johnson in 1938, and didn't looks like didn't come back to film until Seven Days in May, uncredited in 1964. And his run really started picking up with the Paper Chase in 1973. Uh, and then he just worked a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. But what a fascinating leap. What was what was the guy doing? He was probably working at Smith Barney. Well, and he I mean, he was helping uh, Orson Welles because he was I think he was involved in some producing capacity, I thought, um, in Citizen Kane. But maybe I'm wrong in that. Um, I have to look now because I thought he was Orson Welles, whom he affectionately called the dog faced boy. They were such good friends. <laughs> well, because he was involved in like War of the Worlds and everything. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm looking, but um, I'm pretty sure he was somehow involved with the back dealings. Well, and it looks like he was also Citizen doing a King. ton of, of theater at the time, too. Um, yeah. But during the war, he was working for the Office of War Information and uh, involved in broadcasting radio propaganda for Voice of America. Was he in? He wasn't in Mank because here's what I'm reading. Um, Houseman later, however, played a pivotal role in ushering Citizen Kane, which starred Wells. Wells telephoned Houseman, asking him to return to Hollywood to babysit screenwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz while he completed the script and keep him away from alcohol. Still drawn to Wells, as was virtually everyone in his sphere, Houseman agreed. Although Wells took credit for the screenplay of Kane, Houseman stated that the credit belonged to Mankiewicz an assertion that led to a final break with Wells. Houseman took some credit himself for the general shaping of the storyline and for editing the script. Yeah, so that's, I think, quite interesting that he was also kind of involved in that whole controversy, but not brought up in the film, uh, to my recollection. I don't remember either. Yeah. Interesting. I what, what My perhaps favorite line of his in the film, and because it just seems so uh, strange coming from him, it's so meditative of moment when he says, keep silence with me for a minute, won't you? Yes. In the room surrounded by razor blades of glass. Right. That was crazy production design. I thought that was a neat room. And deadly. Yeah, really interesting. I also, I, I mean, we talked about the sport. We talked about how I think it's dumb, but it's also simple and kind of genius. Apparently, it was the, so simple and kind of genius that people wanted Jewison to license it as real leagues. Right. Yeah. Right. And Jewison did not care for that because he said, you don't get the movie. Go watch it again. I'm sure he said that to somebody. <laughs> Go watch the movie again until you understand it. And uh, so I think that it's it's fascinating to look at a list of uh, to look at other notable films just as a brief sidebar where people didn't get the point about the sport. Can you think of any off the top of your head? Because there are a lot more that, than I, I thought. Well, they're not not about sport necessarily, but just movies where the audiences didn't get the point. Well, I think, you know, we've talked about that as the case of Fight Club a number of times where people just didn't quite get it. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we just talked about another one uh, very recently, and I'm completely blanking what that was. But there was some other film similar to Fight Club. I can't remember. Fight Club. uh, We've got uh, Wall Street. People misunderstood oliver stone's making a movie to criticize corporate greed people think greed is good they they thought he was the protagonist american psycho is certainly one we've talked about well yeah and and um uh, wolf of wall street would be one. Wolf, yes absolutely uh another i, I feel like oliver stone is, is sort of corners the market on these kinds of movies yeah him and Cor- scorsese i think scorsese for sure uh death wish um uh, Natural Born Killers, another uh, Oliver Stone. Um, I I feel like these 
these movies are so funny. The, the even the Hunger Games, like we we in our member pre show, we we intentionally sort of dodged the Hunger Ga- Hunger Games, but that's uh, another thing that um, f- another one of those properties that I feel like people are people might be missing the point. <laughs> <laughs> that it's not about sending your children off to die. <laughs> that's not that's not why we do why we do the Hunger Games. <laughs> well, and that's, to the point, to the point, I will just say that Squid Game, the TV show, was fantastic Game, and yes. certainly had a dark thing to say. But now Netflix has right. <laughs> the real Squid Game. I'm like, hmm, I don't know if you learned your right. lesson from the show. Netflix, Netflix. is Houseman. <laughs> Netflix is yeah. Houseman. It's really, it's really challenging, and, and and you know, I mean, I once again, it, it just sort of uh, highlights how Jewison is is uh, uh, prescient in some of the things he's he is trying to say through this movie. I think it's it's crazy, crazy, yeah. very interesting. I, I I do think that it's um, one of the important elements of this film is that the the actual game because it was such a like realistic game that they actually designed and were playing as they were filming all of these various scenes that it re- and because it is fairly violent that the stunt people playing became so critical in the course of producing this that this was the first major hollywood film to actually give credit to the stunt performers which was uh, great to see you know you had a whole screen of the stunt performers that i mean we've been talking about great stunts uh from early in the show all the way back to things like stagecoach which was 1939 and the amazing stuntmen and stunt performers there it here's 1975 where this is the first time that stunt performers are are really given credit which is just it's crazy that it took uh, this long to get to a place to recognize the value of these people in actually delivering uh, the director's vision on screen. Fascinating. Yeah, I I mean, I I generally, I, I think a pretty high, I have a pretty high opinion of the movie. I think just in, in I'm on the the side of social commentary. Um, you know, it, it just seems to uh, resonate even more today than, than it probably did in 1975. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, speaking to getting the thing to screen, what do you know of our fair screenwriter, William Harrison? Are you a Harrahead? I'm not sure that one plays. <laughs> well, you got to try things uh, or you'll I never know. know. You got to try. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I've read anything of his as an author. This was written as a short story. It appeared in Esquire. It is still available online. I'll throw the link in the show notes so people can check it out. It's only a seven page read. But to that end, like, I I know he wrote the novelization of Brubaker, which uh, doesn't really count. So I I guess I don't know much about Harrison other than that he was involved in this. I I don't know much about him either. I just, you know, you look at at the other things that he's sort of credited, novel, uh, Burton and Speak. Uh, to the screenplay Mountains of the Moon, uh, 1990, which is a movie I've heard of, never seen. TV series Welcome to Paradox, never seen that one either. And then A Shining Season, another TV movie in 1979. Um, Obviously, he gets credit on the critically maligned remake uh, of Rollerball in 2002. Is it just critically... (laughs) Popularly, critically, universally, categorically... I don't think he gets screenplay credit. It's just again based on his yeah, short story. Yeah, based on characters, sure. So, it totally Larry Ferguson and John Pogue wrote the script for that one. Oh, but Norman Jewison, I mean, we haven't talked about Norman Jewison much on the show. I I think the only thing we've discussed that that he is directed is The Thomas Crown Affair, uh, the 1968 version of that. But where do you stand with Jewison? Are you a fan of of his work in general? Andy Please, you know, of course, that he was the director of Only You. Mm, good movie. In which he directed Robert Downey Jr., who played a character named Peter Wright and <laughs> Damon Bradley. And I have three of those four names. So come on, That's man. Yes, funny. I'm a fan of Norman Jewison. He brought me Peter Wright, Damon Bradley. <laughs> Um, uh, I, yes, I, yes, I love, I do, I have a, I, I, I do like Norman Jewison films, uh, generally, um, you know, Heat of the Night, Moonstruck, Jesus Christ Superstar. Ugh, who do you think that you really are, Andy? Jesus Christ Superstar. 
I, I I love those movies. Yeah, I'm I'm a fan. I have not seen all of his movies, but man, uh, the ones I have seen, I tend to have a fairly high opinion of. He's an interesting filmmaker. I often find he chooses important topics to explore, and I generally enjoy what he's doing with them. I think sometimes his work is a little, uh, it ends up, sometimes ends up feeling a little safer than what I would like. But in general, I still enjoy that what he's actually doing is trying to uh, get these stories out there. And so I think that's that's what I enjoy about uh, Jewison. I think he has a good sense of drama and comedy, right? Like there are some there are some funny things that he he is able to to get out in the world. I mean, I I love the Russians are coming. The Russians are coming. I haven't seen that in years, but I remember thinking highly of it. Yeah, I think uh, his comedy, his drama, his romance. I you know I think of things like Moonstruck is like that's where oh, I find uh, God. that's probably my favorite film of his. Sweet of the spot. ones that I've seen for yeah. sure, for sure. I haven't seen Injustice for All. Have you seen that one? That seems like one I've heard it's good, important. but I haven't seen it. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, yeah, I I like Norman Jewison. and I think he's he's great. This certainly fits kind of this the type of thing that it look it seems like he likes to explore. Yeah. Yeah, right. You know, really kind of this in in his view uh, as you were saying with the whole how he was against people wanting to throw to to play this sport. The whole point of this film to him was to quote show the sickness and insanity of contact sports and their allure. End quote. And so I yeah I think you know this is one of those things that uh, it's interesting because it seems his point is more about the sport than about uh, you know kind of the dystopian society or corporate interest thing like that. But I think he managed to kind of touch on a number of things. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that makes it kind of interesting those accidental sort of emergent commentaries that come out um that that it change over time i think it's great we haven't really talked about the fact that also it was um you know he mentioned that it had been kind of loosely inspired by films like a clockwork orange which definitely feels of the that same period in time and telling kind of a, a kind of a dystopian future and you can see the comparison when you look at these two films from that period and how there is this draw from one to the other that you could draw a line from one to the other i think that's an interesting element that you know to uh, you know perhaps its detriment was easy for critics to draw that line as far as uh you know the fact that clockwork orange may have worked a little better than this one because this one felt a little um i don't know if it was the pacing issues or what but a lot of critics seem to have uh, more issues with this one upon its release. I think it's one of those films that has uh, perhaps grown in its estimation over time. It's interesting that 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 perspective, because I think when uh, you know you look at a Clockwork Orange, it feels to me so much more of a character exploration and and his journey through who he is at the beginning, who he is at the end, who he struggles to 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 become. And James Caan is is so when he's not on the ring, to your point, he is kind of impenetrable. And you're just not sure where where's your head out at, man, in it from scene to scene until we get to his big moments of of action. Uh, and I, I think that's a that's kind of an easy line to make. Yeah, I think that's I think that's true. All right. That's it. Well, uh, I, then I guess uh, we shall move on. So we'll be right back. But first, our credits. The Next Reel is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson, music by Out of Flux, Oriole Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds all the stats for the awards and numbers at d-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of Movie Conversation. 
It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from the nextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reels logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. All right, here we go. Sequels and remakes. Oh, goodness. Cut to 2002. Well, before we get to 2002, um, you know, as you said, people were uh, enjoyed the concept of this game and it they kind of wanted it to happen. They were trying to find a way. In 1985, they're uh, good on, on the good old Commodore 64. There was a game called Rocket Ball that was kind of similar to the game. And then in 1989, a follow-up game was called Killer Ball that came out on a few other systems like the Atari ST and the Amiga. And then in 1997, another company was trying to develop a uh, video game version of this. That seemed to be where people landed with this. Uh, I don't think it ended up happening, unfortunately. And then... The 2002 remake gets made by John McTiernan, which, you know, it's just bad on so many levels. It was really (laughs) shocking. (laughs) I was really, I was like, okay, John McTiernan, I remember hearing it was bad, but I enjoy John McTiernan. He knows how to direct action. Um, First off, Chris Klein is just tough. You know, I, I think, I think I can really enjoy Chris Klein in the right roles. And, I, you know, if he's going to lead a film, I think it just has to be written and directed right for him. And this wasn't. Like, the writing, there's nothing to like about his character at all. It just made the character of Jonathan just kind of like a dick from the get-go. And you just never cared about him. <laughs> and then you get into the game. It's shot in a much more confusing way. The track is totally different. It's like totally. a figure eight, tr- eight track. And... It, uh, I mean, it has some interesting elements, but it's also shot like this was peak Jiggly Monkey cam. Yep. Like this, this came out, and you know, I, I know we gave that camera technique a lot of ribbing when we did our uh, Born series, but this film uh, seemed to kind of predate most of that Jiggly cam to the point where I'm just like, sometimes they're playing, and I'm just like, I just, I don't know where they are, I don't know who's chasing who, I don't know where anything's happening. And you just kind of lose interest. And it was just done poorly. I do give McTiernan credit for shooting an entire chase sequence at night with infrared Infrared, camera, which was actually kind of interesting. I was like, okay, he's doing, he's going to do it. I was like, wow, he's doing it. And here we go. So that was interesting. And then he ruins it by including twice in that sequence. Once when they accidentally drive through a fence, you get the boing sound effect. Yep. And I'm like, what is that doing in here? <laughs> and then he does the same sound effect again. And I was like, okay, I don't know what is happening. It just turned into like a Looney Tunes thing. It was nonsense. So, yeah, terrible. Is this a Starship Troopers kind of thing where we just don't get it? He's playing four-dimensional chess and we just don't get it. That the boing should I be don't a think sing- so. signal. <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> I don't think I'd so like either. to think so, but yeah. I I think on the on the track the point of the track I you know with the, we're looking at Rollerballs 1975 it's very very simple and I think there was such opportunity to do something to make the track more threatening and I think they I think that in terms of the production design there was opportunity here and what it ended up being was the Batman and Robin ice skating sequence like a rollerblading sequence right it just ended up being it, it, they took something that could have been threatening and made it goofy. 
that's the the yeah. challenge that I had. There's so much about this movie that was just goofy, and uh, so I'm I am I'm sorry, Chris Klein, it didn't play. I'm also sorry, Rebecca Romaine and LL Cool J, uh, because you were misplaced. But maybe the person I am most sorry for is Jean Reno, because come on, man, you don't have to say yes to everything. This was a <laughs> this was a rough period. Ugh, yes, it was. So, yes, it was. Yeah. But yeah, outside of that, there have been um, two games that are similar, although the makers say it wasn't. Uh, it's just similar. It was, it was more of a coincidence. Speedball and the sequel Speedball 2. And last but not least, and this was the one I found most interesting, is that there is actually a chess variant of Rollerball, uh, which um, was invented in 1998. The whole idea is, I mean, if you take a chess board and you take out, except you make it seven by seven instead of eight by eight, and then you take out the central block of nine squares. So you basically have a track of two squares going around a seven a seven by seven board. You each start with uh, one king, one bishop, two rooks, and two pawns. And then you basically chase each other around the <laughs> <laughs> and try to and try to win yeah you have checkmating you you can win by checkmating the enemy king you can bring one's own king to the starting square of the enemy king on the opposite side of the board but only when you've traveled to that side of the board in a clockwise rotation so yeah it's actually a thing it's the chess variant of rollerball so there you i go. am looking at it on wikipedia right now and i kind of can't wrap my head around it and also i want to play it right now yeah, I, I would love that to be integrated into, like, you know, your standard uh, chess apps for your phone. Like, can I play the right. rollerball which, I want to play rollerball variant. Where? Which way do you go? You you have two you rooks, the king and the queen, and, oh, clockwise. Okay, so you lead with your pawns. Yeah, just like chess. Yeah, Just like chess. And all the moves are the same. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I think, let's see, does anybody move different? Yeah, you, you can move backward. Uh, counterclockwise, but I think only certain, uh, I don't know. I'd have to really dig into a little more to fully understand the, the rules, but feels like something that needs a full next real investigation. Like, I think we need to play this game. I want to start playing rollerball yeah. chess. Sounds rollerball fun. chess. This might be the only anyway, way to play chess. Okay. That is, yeah. Most interesting thing to come out of this. <laughs> Here's the thing that I think is interesting that when we talk about 1975's rollerball, <laughs> bringing it back, there are awards to talk about indeed yes indeed this film was nominated for four wins had five other nominations over at the bafta awards uh the film won best art direction it was nominated for best cinematography but lost to barry linden it uh was uh nominated for best film editing but not but lost to dog day afternoon Nominated for Best Soundtrack, but lost to Nashville, which I, I guess I can understand that. At the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films, we already talked about this on our Boy and His Dog episode, James Caan tied with Don Johnson for Best Actor. And uh, it won Best Cinematography, it won Best Science Fiction Film, Beating a Boy and His Dog, and The Stepford Wives, uh, which we talked about in a member bonus episode. And at the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America Nebula Awards, it was nominated for Best Dramatic Writing. Uh, we've talked about this uh, as well. Both this, A Boy and His Dog, and Dark Star all lost to Young Frankenstein. Last but not least, the reason we're here, the Hugo Awards, the Best Dramatic Presentation. We've already talked about this. Um, this is the series we're doing. A Boy and His Dog is the winner, beating out Dark Star, Monty Python, and the Holy Grail, and this film. And I suppose this is the last film in our series, so this is our chance to chat about the Hugo Awards. We talked about all four of those, and we added in the Stepford Wives. When, when you think about, like, the Hugo Awards and you see that these four nominations, uh, like, do you feel like Rollerball should be in there? Does it does it fit? Oh, I absolutely do. You know, I, I guess the the one that stands out to me is, I think, the, what we talked about last week. It's Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Right, yeah, and that's because for Best Dramatic Presentation, uh, you know, this is the society, uh, the World Science Fiction Society, they give out this award for the best science fiction or fantasy works. And so to that end, that was our case last week. Does Monty Python and the Holy Grail fit in the realm of science fiction or fantasy? Yeah. 
I don't know. And that's that's kind of where we landed. And so knowing that, would you put something like the Stepford Wives in place of Holy Grail? Yeah, I think I would. I think it gets to that sort of subversive science fiction dramatically presented that fits with the rest of the movies in this in this category. And so I think it would be an easy substitution for me. And I, I you know, I stand by that. I think Rollerball fits with certainly with Boy and His Dog and well, all of them, Dark Star and Step- Stepford Wives. I didn't, I didn't love, love any of them, with the exception of Holy Grail. <laughs> but, but they all felt of a piece to me. They all felt on the same tone. It certainly speaks of the era, and I think that's something that I enjoyed with all of these. It it, it does kind of fit kind of the post hippie vibe. You're getting a lot of kind of absurdist comedy. You're getting some viewpoints of society. And the way that it views, uh, you know, kind of the the impending nuclear wars and things like that. Like we're seeing some interesting future depictions and, and stories. I do agree as much as I mean, Monty Python, and the Holy Grail is by far my favorite on the list of these properties. But it also feels like the one that I'm like, Ugh. I mean, I guess you could say the whole idea of the lady in the lake and that whole mythology that comes around King Arthur kind of pushes it into the realm of fantasy. I suppose that may be how you can get it there. But at the same time, I feel like perhaps Stepford Wives would be the better fit. And then putting the Stepford Wives in here, where would you land? I don't know. I may go, I'm I'm kind of torn between Rollerball and Stepford Wives, honestly, if I take Holy Grail out. Oh, yeah. I think I, um, oh, if I had to choose, I think it'd probably be Stepford Wives. Is that weird? It makes sense. I mean, and those are the two that I would I would pick. You know, I think yeah. that both of those are strong. Yeah. Me too. I, Me too. I do just need to point out there is actually one other nominee this year at the Hugo Awards. Um uh, it was a project called The Capture, written by Robert Asprin with the artist Phil Foglio. Uh we didn't include it, um, but this is you know, this is why the Hugo Awards are interesting. Um it was best dramatic presentation. It was a slideshow that they put on. And so it isn't a film, but it's um, it was kind of this fan art that they had kind of created. Yeah, I'd I'd love to kind of get a sense of what that actually was, but I my understanding is it's not something that um, that you can uh, find these days. And so we cut it. It's not on any of our lists. Yeah, it, we're usually not talking about slideshows when it comes to this podcast. There's so always anyway, room that's for the worst. first. <laughs> that's right. All right. Well, how did it do at the box office? Well, Jewison's film cost either five or six million dollars to make. I'm going to say it cost five million and an additional one million for prints and advertising. That is a total of about thirty four point two million in today's dollars. The movie opened June 25th, 1975, opposite Richard Brooks's Bite the Bullet and Cooley High. The movie did well for itself, going on to earn what looked like $8.8 million, which is about $50.2 million in today's dollars. All told, the film actually lands with an adjusted profit per finished minute of $128,000. Probably would have made more had Jewison said, sure, take the sport, have at it. God, Jewison <laughs> would be a legend. A legend. <laughs> this would be, this would be, it'd be, it'd be NRL, National Rollerball League. That was what we would all be saying. We would stand up and sing our corporate anthem and then beat each other in the face until death. Oh, so good. So good. Ooh. All right. Well, I am really glad we watched this again. It's great to have it on the list. Fun to see James Conn so young. And uh, it's a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. Great movie. Glad to glad to get it on the list. Well, that is it uh, for today. We'll be right back for our ratings. But first, here's the trailer for next week's movie, kicking off our next series, the 1988 Academy Awards Best Effects Visual Effects, Joe Dante's Inner Space. Test pilot Tuck Pendleton wants to make history. Supermarket clerk Jack Putter needs a vacation. Sir, I'm Jack, sorry. you're late. That's not good. You know it's coupon day. Lieutenant Pendleton is about to be miniaturized, placed into this needle, and then injected into this rabbit. Rock and roll. But something went wrong. And Tuck's about to get a new destination. <gasps> Inside Jack Putter. I'm in a man. Hello, can you hear me? I'm possessed! Now, Jack's got twice the problems. How you doing, Jack? 
but he's double the man. With Tuck on his side. Kicking more cows! In his gut. <laughs> and on his case. You're not gonna back groceries all your life, are you, Jack? And only 24 hours left for Jack to get out of danger. So that Tuck can get out of Jack. <laughs> Dennis Quaid, Martin Short. Give yourself a shot of adventure. Inner Space. It is hard to believe we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. The Originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals links to the source material for all of our adapted film discussions. Purchasing through our links supports the show. In Season 13, we explore various awards categories and the films nominated in them. We wrapped up our 1940 Best Picture series with adaptations of Mice and Men from John Steinbeck and Wuthering Heights from Emily Bronte's novel, not to mention the play Dark Victory by George Brewer Jr. and Bertram Block. The 1947 Academy Award adapted screenplay series featured Anna and the King of Siam based on Margaret Langdon's book, plus The Best Years of Our Lives, Brief Encounter, and The Killers. The 1952 cinematography nominees included Death of a Salesman and a Streetcar Named Desire, A Place in the Sun, based on both a play and a book, and Strangers on a Train, based on Patricia Highsmith's first novel. So many great movies based on books and plays, like Beckett, The Pumpkin Eater, A Boy and His Dog, Rollerball, The Princess Bride, Congo, The Scarlet Letter, Jackie Brown, The Deep End, The Gray, The Woman in Black, and Top Gun Maverick, which I'm very much looking forward to revisiting. Get the source books at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read or reread from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. Letterboxd. Andy, here we go. Letterbox. I can honestly say, given our conversation today, I have no idea what you're going to do with this movie. I don't have a guess. I know it's not one. It's not. But I'm pretty sure it's not five. This is a film that I think I'm torn. I feel like it's a four star film if it weren't for some of the pacing issues that end up kind of like um, really slowing things down. So I'm going to say three and a half for this one. Three and a half and a heart. Well, uh, I think we are in the same ballpark. For me, it is the it is the pacing. I I had enjoyed more of my time in the rink. We didn't talk about the music choices, which I thought were extraordinary. Opening with the Takata and Fugue is just great. I just love it. Talk about building the mood for the drama of this thing. Um, I thought that was fantastic. Andre Priven conducting. Great, great choices of music all the way around. And I think that really levels up the stuff, um, you know, the the uh, rest of the play. But I'm still a three star and a heart. Three stars and a heart. All right. Well, that averages us out to uh, three and a quarter, which over on our letterbox, we'll just round up to three and a half with a heart. And uh, yeah, if you want to find me over there, you can look for at Soda Creek Film. Pete is at Pete Wright and the show is at The Next Reel. So what did you think about Rollerball? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Hop into the Show Talk channel over in our Discord community where we will be talking about the movie this week. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. <laughs> Letterbox give it, Andrew. As Letterbox always do it. Okay. I went right for the middle. Did Where'd you go? Up or down? Mine has uh, nothing. It just has a... No, it doesn't even have a heart. Just... It's just this just movie words. exists. Just it's a participation words. review. Okay. Well, well, go first. All right. Mine is by Emma Stefanski, who has this to say. Would propose marriage to James Caan's big lapels. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, the All right. 70s. Good for the 70s. Uh, I've got one from HK Fanatic. <laughs> and, uh, it's three stars. 
thunderingly obvious in its exposition and social commentary, but it's a big-budget, post-Kubrickian sci-fi spectacle released by a major studio at a time when such films seemed to matter. If this were made today, it'd be a part one in a YA trilogy that would end with Jonathan E's character joining some kind of underground resistance, and I still got a flinch when some poor SOB gets their head crushed on the track. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that is so perfect. Had uh, only McTiernan made the movie in the post 2010s, he actually could have ushered in the rollerball resistance, the RR. And we could have actually yes. had a YA trilogy out of this movie. But the third movie in the trilogy would be split into a part one, part two. So it would be a quadrilogy. That's how it works these days. <sighs> That's how it you works. Love, you so, love true. so true. So <laughs> true. Thanks, Letterboxd. <laughs> 